Micah. Yes. Uh, Adbusters Magazine. Here's a. Here's just a copy for you to to see. But Adbusters, um, you know, is a pretty interesting place. I'm sure to work. Uh, but the thing I'd love for you to maybe just describe to everyone is is the general. Um, idea behind why Adbusters and what it is that you guys are trying to take on. Sure. You know, the Adbusters got started actually 20 years ago, so this summer is our 20th anniversary. And um, it started when the founder um, was living in British Columbia. He's a filmmaker at the time. And the logging industry was putting all these ads on television saying, don't worry about the, the fact that we're cutting down old growth forests. It's great because we're protecting forests, actually. And he said, you know what, I think they're lying to me. I'm going to put out an ad that says completely the opposite. So he made an ad, 30 seconds, that you can watch on our website. And he went down to the television station and said, OK, I want to buy this time for this ad. And they said, absolutely not. You can't buy that ad. What are you talking about? Hmm. And that's when he started to realize that we're inundated with advertising that lies to us. And we're not allowed to say the opposite message. So our magazine really is, is the message behind our magazine is that there's a, there's a mental environment, just as if there, just as just as we see the physical environment is being polluted by toxins, you know, lead and whatnot, our, our mental environment is being polluted by advertising. And advertising leads to depression, um, lots of problems with overconsumption. I mean, you could really link our environmental degradation directly to advertising. Yeah. It's simple. They have an opinion on this. <laughs> um, you know, as you talk about the mental environment. I mean, could you describe even more specifically maybe some examples of this mental environment that we're all exposed to, but maybe we don't recognize it that easily? Yeah, I mean, like, if you, there's, it depends on who you ask, but basically Americans are, you know, exposed to 300 to maybe 2,000 ads per day. And these ads are interjected into our televisions, into our, um, you know, magazines. So. This, this world that we uh, is created by advertising, we actually live in kind of an imaginary world. We see the world through advertising. And that world, they tell us lies. They tell us that endless consumption will lead towards uh, spiritual fulfillment, that McDonald's is a, a kind of religion. Um, and this is really what our position is, is that they're, they're, they're lying to us. They're creating an imaginary world, and that this imaginary world we inhabit is actually bad for us. We should go the opposite direction. And so... A few examples of this, a, a recent article that you wrote uh, that just caught me by surprise because I hadn't seen many people talking about it. Of course, now it's started to become a little more popular probably a year later. Um, was an article entitled, Commit Facebook Suicide. Right. Tell us about that. Okay. So, you know, I kind of missed the whole Facebook um, thing only by chance. I just, I just had never really signed up. I knew all my friends were on it. And after I got married, at one point I found out that my wedding photos were on Facebook. And I, and I had, you know, I was starting to wonder, why, why are they on Facebook? Okay, there's one reason they're on Facebook is that my wife's friend put them up. But there's another reason they're on Facebook. They're on Facebook because Facebook encourages people to put their personal information on these websites. Now, why does Facebook do that? It's because Facebook is interested in something called demand generation, okay? They're not interested in, in uh, like, Google demand fulfillment. They don't care, like, I want to buy... Uh, this product, where can I buy it? They're not interested in that. What they want is to convince you to use your friends to sell products. So basically, I buy something. Facebook wants my friends all to know that I bought that so that all my friends want to buy that using this model of envy that we have. And so Facebook is essentially the commercialization of friendship. If friendship's no longer about hanging out with people that you enjoy, face <laughs> Facebook has turned into instead a profit-making enterprise where I'm subtly somehow advertising to my friends. This is the... Ins you know, the really uh, tricky way that advertising is now. You know, we hate advertising and commercials, but now they're turning us all into advertisers where we all are trying to sell our friends' products. Now, some would say that's a pretty cynical view and mm. that uh, there's good in these things, like mm. Facebook. Do you, do you think there's good in things like that? I mean, I think that there, you know, like Shane Hips was saying, every technology has a, has a downside. And, you know, you see this with Paul Virilio, a philosopher, who says that every technology has an accident. Mm. Uh, and I think that, yeah, originally when these things start, they have a good intention. But I think that things like Facebook, there's a tremendous downside to them. And the fact is, the downside is that, you know, my college friends, I'm not on Facebook, and it's very hard for me to keep in touch with them because everyone's on Facebook now. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is really the question, is that where are these things leading us and being suspicious of them? And what do you think it does? I mean, what do you, what do you think's happening with friendships of the people that you've seen as it relates to Facebook? Because I know yeah. that's... We did. We ask everybody who's coming here. Ninety percent of them have a Facebook account. Um, I think it was somewhere close to forty-five percent update their status three, four times a day. Yeah. Um, what do you think that? What do you think that's doing to um, to the mental environment? I mean, what's it doing to people's 
brains, not from a neuroscience perspective, yeah. but maybe our perception of reality? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the New York Times recently uh, reported that we spend about eight hours a day looking at screens, okay? So when we say, I think that one of the problems with technology is that it, it, we think that it's a directly replacing something else. So Facebook is the next generation of friends. I don't think so. I think Facebook represents a different thing entirely. So we spend eight hours a day looking at the screens, and this is the primary way we get information about our friends is through this screen. So, you know, honestly, we can really say that our friend is the screen. It's not the actual person. And I think that, you know, there's some books coming out. There's actually a really interesting book for people who want to look at the neuroscience aspect of this called iBrain, where the authors argue that, you know, this, this time spent interacting with screens decreases our ability to do empathy, increases our ability to actually read people's physical, uh, you know, emotions and whatnot. So it leads to the fact where we're going to be really good at texting our friends via Facebook, but when we meet them in the bar, we might not even be able to understand <laughs> socially what they're talking about, you know? Right, right. Well, talk about how personal this is for you, because I know in your own life, I mean, this is something you don't just write about, mm -hmm. but you're demonstrating and all the time. Um, talk about some of the most recent campaigns, maybe the, the noise pollution campaign you've been involved in. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I like to see myself as an activist, you know? And when I was in at Swarthmore College, uh, I started a group that was anti-war. And the first thing we did, we said, what, how can we stop this war? We'll create a really nice looking website. So we spent all of our time building this great website that you guys can still go to now. We got 20,000 people to go there a month. And you know what, it didn't really do anything. And, and since those, that time, I've been feeling this really sense of, you know, it just doesn't work, these websites. And so something happened to me that really knocked this in. And I'm, as I live in Binghamton, New York, and Binghamton, as you heard from the shootings, is kind of a sad place to live. So this industrial dry cleaning plant, uh, run by one of the wealthiest families in the area, decides to expand a dry cleaning plant into a residential area. I don't know how they got the zoning permission to um, knock down two houses to expand an industrial healthcare linens plant that you know does tons of laundry per day, but they did. And, this, and I wake up one morning, and there's this horrible noise, absolutely horrible noise, going on for 12 hours a day starting at 3 a.m. <laughs> and I call the company, and I say, you know, would you turn, down, turn off the noise, please? And they say, no. I call them again. He hangs up on me. And, I'm, and I say, what are you talking about? There's all these people who live around you. You think you can actually do that noise while we're here? We live here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I didn't start a website, you know. I went out and started putting up signs on the, <laughs> on, the, on the poles. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm young, I'm not white, and I'm connecting with people who are retirees, with teachers, with other students. And they're all like, yeah, this is annoying. Why? Because it's, it's, it unites around something that we can all tangibly feel, the fact that we want to live in a nice area. Mm -hmm. It was nice before this company came. Anyways, suffice it all. The point is that before looking at the internet as the best way to communicate with people, you know, was it better to have 20,000 visitors on our website a month, or is it better to have 10 people in this organization, very small organization, because it's just a tiny little two-block mm -hmm. radius? And I would say it's better to have those 10 people, because it actually builds friendships. It t empowers people on a physical level. Mm. So, so those are some of the problems that exist. I mean, one of the ways you guys have tried to take on the problem is by creating something called Culture Jammers. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what you guys see as some of the solutions. Yeah. Well, I think... You know, it, the real thing is that the way that it, we want to attack things is to say, look, um, we need to change the way that information flows in the society. Right now, information flows basically from top-down model, you know? And I don't think that the internet really changes this. I think that most people get their information from a few major sites. So we have this problem where, you know, you have multi-million dollar advertising campaigns that, that bring culture down this way. And what we want to say is, no, look, look at our world instead as a kind of contested space where we as people who live here can look at advertising and, and jam it. You know, we can, we can, we can, like, and this has been successful with cigarettes, you know, is we've taken Marlboro ads and we've taken Camel ads and we've said, no, you know what, smoking's not cool and I'm going to prove that to you by making it look like the, the Camel has cancer and the Marlboro man is impotent, you know, and, and it actually really works. So I think that what, what needs to be done is that we look at culture, um, in a way that it can be worked with again. Not in this, like, you know, that I'm just getting yelled at all the time by this advertising, you know. Yeah. Instead, I, I interact with it. I change it. I deface it. Vandalism is a very good way to get out there and spread a message. And I think, really. <laughs> he didn't say evangelism. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so one of the campaigns, and you guys do a lot of campaigns, yeah. um, is is a buy nothing day. Um, talk about what that is. Okay, that's one of our 
most you know, popular campaigns. And it basically is a campaign where we say, you know, one day a year, I know this sounds crazy, one day a year, don't buy anything. Absolutely nothing on this day. And what we like to do is the day after Thanksgiving, which is the, uh, you know, supposed to be historically the most, uh, the busiest shopping day. So we just tell people, look, what, what would happen, similar to the experiment we did last time with these cell phones, what would happen actually if you try to buy nothing? You know, and I've tried to do these many years, and you know what inevitably what happens? It's very difficult. You think it's very easy. You're like, oh, well, that's so easy. I just won't buy anything. And then you get onto your day, and you're like, whoa, I always buy coffee every morning. I do, I do these other things. And it, it really is all about changing our perception of what it means to be human. Right now, we're consumers, you know, and what it means to be human is to consume for us. And what I think we want to say is instead, being human is something else. It's not being a consumer. And so we change this idea of just consuming into buy nothing day, hopefully buy nothing week, and start, we, and start decreasing our consumption. I mean, this is the best way to get out of debt is just to stop spending money, right? Yeah. So you guys get why to me this is so important. I mean, here, here's a guy in this magazine. It's not a Christian magazine. It's not led by Christians. Um, but they understand something very fundamental, which is that we're not designed to be consumers. Um, and they're fighting against that in society um, because in their soul they, they recognize this isn't what it means to be fully human and they're trying to offer a better way. I know one of the things you guys have created is something called the black spot. Mm. Um, it's like shoes you're wearing. Show everybody your shoes. So we got Tom shoes, we have black spot, <laughs> black spot. shoes. What, yeah. What's the deal with black spot? Okay, so the basic you know, thing is that you can sit around and you can critique all the time. We started our main target was really Nike because Nike really cornered the market on cool. They told everyone it's cool to buy our products, it's cool to put you know, our brands on you. And they really built an empire based on cool. You know, and for a long time, we did a lot of work to uncool Nike. We spent a lot of time jamming their ads, telling people, look, Nike's not cool. You know, Nike is a, um, just selling you another lie, making money off of your dreams. And, in, and after a while, you know, it started to be like, well, critique, 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 but then what? You know? And we said, and it was very controversial because our readers are very not interested in advertising. We said, you know what, we're going to make a shoe. We are going to make a shoe that's going to put Nike out of business. Audacious plan because we don't really have an advertising budget. So, <laughs> so, so we started making a shoe. The first shoe we made uh, was called the V1, and that was based off of a, because Nike owns Converse All Star. So all these people who think Converse is cool, it's not cool anymore to wear Converse. We make a shoe that looks like the Converse that we hope you would move towards as being a cool alternative. Um, so. That w worked, and then we started doing the V2, and this is the V2 that I'm wearing now. It has a recycl re recycled tire sole. But the main point is just that, you know, the black spot vision is that we take all of these things that the corporations have taken from us, and we take them back. I mean, there was a time when there were shoe factories more than just, like, one company, you know, ran things. Like, we used to have corner stores, and if you go to, like, third world countries, you still see that they have, like, little shops. I think that that's really a viable model for getting the money back into our local communities. And it's not that we want to create another Omni brand. No, the, the Black Spot is really an open brand. What we like to say is that it, um, each, com each community could make their own Black Spot shoe that's not a copyright, copyrighted idea, but instead that we look out at the world and we say, you know what, I don't like going to Starbucks anymore. I'm going to create a Black Spot cafe, and hopefully other people will go there, and that that culture that is in this cafe will be indicative of the people who go here, not from some corporate top-down you know, image makers. So that's basically our perspective, is that it's time to really get out there and say, it, on the actor's perspective, a lot of people are afraid of touching money, because yeah. we critique capitalism so much, we think that it's, that it's money that's the problem. I think that that just gives up the battle to the, co to the corporations. Hmm. So we didn't... Uh talk about this beforehand, I was going to ask you this, but uh, the arc that I've been reading kind of in Adbusters over time is this, um, you know, the idea that consumption's not good for society, and it's a little bit anti-capitalistic, mm -hmm. maybe not even a little bit, it, it feels very anti-capitalistic. So I'm curious just your own personal thoughts on in the last few months as you've seen the economy in America collapse and you see people saying Americans need to go spend more. Mm. What does that do to your soul? Mm, yeah, I think that is the absolute wrong direction. You know, and I think that what my wife and I like to do is we just, um, we don't spend. So we don't have a car. You know, obviously I have to spend money on food and stuff. But we take all that money that we don't spend and we just put it in a savings account. And I think that um, 
that is really a viable alternative to this idea of spending. And it's quite frankly, we should do the opposite. We should decrease our consumption. Because I've actually learned that the economy thus far hasn't really affected my wife and I because we live at what would be considered probably poverty levels, you know, by people. Because we just don't really buy things, you know. So you put all that money that you're saving and you put it into a savings account, not into the stock market. And that really, I think, changes the whole idea of what it means to uh, survive an economic collapse. We don't need to have our society based anymore on consumption. They're, I know that they're afraid because, you know, 60% of our economy is based solely on consumption. But I'm sorry, we live on a, f a finite planet, and infinite growth is only going to lead into a very dark, dark future. And I think that we spend a lot of time in Adblusters just saying, look, let's be honest, if we continue down this path, we know what's going to happen. It's going to be a horrible future with a, a completely destroyed Earth and, you know, more pandemic flus and more of these problems that we're having now. So we have to just, it's quite simple, just stop spending money. Just don't buy anything. Hmm. Seems simple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, talk about the spiritual aspect of Adbuster. So I read this, and as I'm reading it, um, like this, this, the moment ago where you were talking about it's not allowing us to be fully human. I mean, mm -hmm. that deeply connects with me because I feel like my faith calls me to be more fully human yeah. and to live into how God's designed us to be. Um, how do you... Uh, how do you feel about the spiritual aspects of what you're talking about, and how do you guys define what that even means? Yeah, I mean, that's another one of these things that I think we're really bucking the trend, is that, you know, um, this magazine really does reject this enlightenment model of materialist conception of the world. And I think that that's because that really under, that's what really underpins consumption and, and capitalism. Capitalism tells us that the only thing that makes you worthwhile is if you have money or if you can buy nice things. We reject that entirely. I think that's a completely flat model of what the world is. I think the world is much more mysterious and special and full of you know, all of these great things. And I think that capitalism and consumerism tells us completely the opposite. Because if, what it, if what's important in life is actually the things that you can get while sitting quietly in your home, then why would you need to buy anything? They need to distract us and tell us that's not true. So the spiritual aspect of Adbusters really is this position that, you know, we need to get away from the empty, cons cons endless consumption of things and go back to a more um, spiritual way. Well, in closing, I mean, what would you say to church leaders who um, lead faith communities, um, some of them even have marketing budgets mm. to try to get people into their churches. How do you think that's consistent with what you would imagine a church should be doing? You know, I think that you have to you have to weigh these things. I think that what's important is to realize that advertising is a form of pollution. And I think that what it could be replaced with, I know it might be more difficult in the long run, is a different model based on maybe, you know, face-to-face -face communication. I think that the way the technology really works is it gives us fast uh, and really quick uh, victories. Like, oh, 20,000 people came to my website. Well, maybe it's better to get three people into your church or whatever. So I think, yeah, it's basically change your idea of what success means and maybe lower it down. Mm. And I think advertising, yeah, is not the way to go. Please thank Micah for being with us this morning.